Well, I hope the thousands of you that were without power, and some of you still are, are back in the saddle, back in action. And uh, we appreciate you being here on a Monday morning on KCMO Talk Radio. I know that, you know, at its peak, you had 186,000 outages at one given time, according to Evergy, and 244,000 customers overall lost power on Friday. So I know for many of you, it was a uh, tumultuous weekend trying to get the power back on. And hopefully now, as John just noted on the news, about uh, 14,000 folks, it sounds like, across the metro Mm -hmm. are without power. And... um, We'll guide them along here this morning, John. If they got the old radio set up, hopefully we'll be able to take care of them. My power went out for three minutes. Okay. <laughs> take the game, not the player, folks. <laughs> yeah, I got lucky. Uh, lucky. No storm damage. I had to move a branch from behind my car. whoop de doo yeah, yeah, so it was one of those, uh, you know, like you see the meme when the um, – the plastic uh, chair is is knocked <laughs> over in the backyard. You know, pray for the survivors of hurricane or storm. Yeah. Fill in the blank name. Almost. Well, like that's that good. There. That's yeah. good. That's good. And Mark, I know, was driving his daughter to dance class because Mark is one of those hard-o dads who would never miss a dance class for a six-year-old over ninety mile an hour straight line <laughs> winds. Isn't that right, Mark? <laughs> That's right. She had an audition for a new gymnastics team or something like that. And so I was like, I can't miss this. we got to leave early. And then we're halfway there, and then it hits. Well, did she make the team because nobody else showed up? Um, sh- so they have one more week of tryouts next week, and then so we'll know by the end of this week. All right. Well, very good. Uh, that's great dad work by you. The guy's driving down to, you know, through Johnson County, getting ready for a, uh, uh, a tryout session for dance while his – uh, daughter's in the back seat with 90 mile an hour straight line wins. So nice job by you there, Mark. Give yourself a round of applause. Unbelievable. Uh, that that is great. I spent like a hundred bucks at Home Depot on plants. Like, did I'm out there rusting those things <laughs> inside? Going, no, you don't. Man, that wind was no, like 60 no. miles an hour. I stepped out on the porch like, holy cow. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that's bad timing by you, John, on the plants, by the way. But uh, I'm right. glad you got them inside, most importantly. <laughs> most importantly. But for those of you without power, uh, we'll update you throughout the morning. We've got the Evergy outage map here at uh, KCMO headquarters that we'll update you on throughout the morning. So be sure to uh, tune in. And as soon as that gets back up, we're also working on trying to get somebody from Evergy on the show. But uh, obviously, we know they're going a mile a minute right now. But if we can make that happen, we will do that for you here on KCMO Talk Radio. So as we kick it off on a Monday on the national news side of things, you know, no one's ever going to confuse me or probably many of you with, uh, you know, five-star generals like Douglas MacArthur, uh, Dwight Eisenhower obviously comes to mind. No no one's ever going to do that, right? But I do know this much. If I am the president of the United States... If I am a national security advisor, I would not be going around telling the world what my plans are when it comes to giving weapons to Ukraine. So by now, you know uh, that Joe Biden kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit when he noted that we're kind of low on ammunition a few days ago in terms of what we're giving to Ukraine. Not a great moment for Joe Biden. And we talked about that at the time. It's like, okay, why would you signal to the world that you're running low on the artillery ammunition rounds that you are sending to Zelensky? Why would you tip off? I mean, of all the dumb things Joe says, usually the dumb things are just like accidental or he kind of gets confused on what he's trying to say. But the one time he's actually coherent in the last six months, he says something that is incredibly stupid from a strategic standpoint. So then, obviously, you have national media asking about it over the weekend, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was asked yesterday by Chuck Todd to meet the press on what their plan is regarding cluster bombs, sending them to Ukraine, what the stockpile is like, and here's what Jake Sullivan had to say. President Biden said uh, recently that the U.S. gave cluster bombs to Ukraine in part because the U.S. is low on other ammunition to give the Ukrainians. That's a pretty... Shocking admission. Uh, Is it acceptable to the Biden administration that the U.S. is low on ammunition? And what are you going to do about it? Well, when we came into office, 
uh, we found that the overall stocks of 155 ammunition, which is the NATO standard ammunition you use for artillery rounds, uh, was relatively low. But more importantly, Jake, we discovered that the ability to mass produce that ammunition would take not days or weeks or months, but years to get to the level that we needed. So the President Biden ordered his Pentagon to work rapidly to scale up the ability of the United States to produce all the ammunition we could ever need for any conflict at any time in the future. We are in the middle of doing that. So that was uh, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, on Jake Tapper, uh, not on Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. I get my meathead white liberals with big foreheads mixed up once in a while. So uh, that was on CNN's uh, Jake Tapper show, not on Meet the Press. But you get the point. I mean, you look at what these guys are saying between Biden in the last few days saying, yeah, we're low on ammo. And now Jake Sullivan goes out there and you heard what he just said to Jake Tapper And you say to yourself, is there a worse collection of uh, unstrategic military folks that you could get into one room? I mean, Joe Biden, for the most part, has been on the wrong side of history when it comes to every foreign policy decision for the last 50 years. Now, this to me is not his worst. In fact, it's probably his best in terms of how he's handled Ukraine. That's not saying much. I know it's a very low bar based on how wrong Joe Biden has been on national security, but the whole premise of uh, dealing with Putin by essentially allowing Ukrainians to fight their own war and not requiring a single American troop to put their lives at risk, uh, that's the best play. I mean, that that does make sense from a strategic perspective. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, nobody wants our young men, our young women over in Ukraine. Nobody that it would be wildly politically unpopular. But as long as the Ukrainians are willing to continue to fight for themselves, and they do appear to be more than willing to do that, if we fund them, and yes, I do believe we have to make sure that the the, uh, checks are going to the right places, shall we say. I understand the concerns, legitimate concerns of corruption when you're sending that kind of money to a country and not really having any idea where the money is going. Those are all legitimate concerns. But put that aside for a second. Just the, the, the broad theme of saying, hey, we've got this problem with Putin. And sure, maybe Putin wouldn't have done this in hindsight a year and a half ago if Trump was still in office. But that really doesn't matter right now. All we can deal with is the here and now. And even Donald Trump was pretty supportive of Zelensky. I don't know if you heard uh, Trump talking at this Turning Point USA event over the weekend. He did an interview on Sunday, and he sat down and uh, take a listen to what he had to say to Maria Bartiromo on Fox News. Now, Trump always oversimplifies. Let's roll it. You said you could end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours. Yes, I How did. How would you do that? Uh, I know Zelensky very well. I felt he was very honorable because when they asked him about the perfect phone call that I made, he said it was indeed perfect. He, he said it was, he didn't even know what they were talking about. He could have grandstanded, oh, I felt threatened. Well, that's not going to be enough for Putin to stop bombing no, Ukraine. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I, what I'm saying is that I know Zelensky very well and I know Putin very well, even better. And I had a good relationship, very good with both of them. I would tell Zelensky, no more, you got to make a deal. I would tell Putin, if you don't make a deal, we're going to give them a lot. We're going to give more than they ever got if we have to. I will have the deal done in one day. Now, in classic Trump form, of course, <laughs> there are some Trumpisms there. Uh, I don't think it would be one day. But, you know, the premise that Trump is making there is a very good one. It's a very smart one. Trump's basically saying, hey, uh, I'm going to tell Zelensky, you got to figure out a way off here, because right now Zelensky is in no way incentivized to find an off ramp in this entire debacle. I mean, as long as we keep giving him a blank check and he continues to look like a national hero, why wouldn't he continue what he's been doing? At some point, we got to tell him, hey, uh, we're cutting you off. And then on the back end, yeah, it makes sense. Trump talks to Putin, his old pal, and he says, hey, uh, knock it off. Come to a deal that makes everybody look good. Now, I'm not saying it would go down that easily, but Trump's premise is a good one. 
and it's not totally different from what has happened over the last 6 to 12 months. It's just simply more concise with an end in sight because Joe Biden's plan has no end in sight. This administration has simply said, yes, we, we must stand with Ukraine with no end in sight. And yes, we should, but there should be an off-ramp and there should be an end. And at this point, nobody in power, for whatever reason, has any interest in making sure they find that end, at least as we sit here right now. 913-408-7710 as we get it going on a Monday morning here on KCMO Talk Radio. That, of course, is our Call in line ends our a text line here at KCMO Talk Radio. Of course, you can also stream us on the KCMO Talk Radio app. Uh, we've got a lot to dive into here this morning, along with the story I have to get to on how uh, a lot of us think that we know what Mayor Quentin Lucas's next political move is going to be, but a new report suggests that that is not close to being the case. We'll dive into that and much more coming up on a Monday. Pete Mundo on KCMO. So when you think about what state you're going to live in, maybe you're a transplant to Kansas or Missouri. Maybe you're a lifer here. It doesn't really matter. Whether you're a lifer here and you've thought about moving somewhere else or you're a transplant here and you came here for uh, a new start, you came here maybe for uh, the good schools, depending on where you are in town. You came here for the quality cost of living, whatever it might be. What are the things that you, when you consider where you're going to live, what are the things that are at the top of your list? Well, according to CNBC, who just put out America's 10 worst states to live and work in for 2023, they would think that your access to abortion and whether or not you think that boys should compete in girls' sports and your support for girls competing in girls' sports, boys competing in girls' sports, is something that you consider heavily when you think about where you want to live and what you want your future to entail. I, I was blown away. I mean, this is like something out of a left-wing Babylon Bee, CNBC publishing over the weekend America's 10 worst states to live in and work in in 2023. And by the way, one of our two states made it. <laughs> Missouri came in at number six on this list. I'll give you the other nine on this list. But here's why Missouri makes the list for one of the top 10 worst states to live and work in, according to CNBC. CNBC writes here, the show me state is showing abortion opponents the way. In 2019, the state became the first to enact a so-called trigger law, which went into effect moments after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade in 2022. The law, one of the strictest in the nation, bans all abortions except in the case of a medical emergency, which the abortion provider must prove. Also, Missouri's violent crime rate is among the nation's highest. It says here that 2023 Life, Health, and Inclusion score, sounds like ESG, is an F for Missouri, according to CNBC. The only strength that Missouri has going for it is air quality. Its weaknesses, according to CNBC, voting rights, reproductive rights, and yes, crime. That is what they claim are the weaknesses in the state of Missouri. And that's why CNBC calls Missouri one of America's 10 worst states to live and work in for 2023. Now, it doesn't really matter how you feel about abortion. But you tell me if you have met anybody in your life who takes a job, who starts a business, who makes a move based on their access to get an abortion. Like actually decides I'm going to get up and move and plant a flag down and start a new life somewhere else in large part because of the abortion access in that state. Have you met that person in your life? Now I haven't. That doesn't mean that you haven't, but I have not met that person before. So I'm looking at this list, I see Missouri on it, and I say, okay, what, what, what else? Who else is on this list? What are the top 10 worst states to live and work in for 2023 per CNBC? Because already it seems like a joke. Here's what else made the top 10. Florida, oh, only the state that, you know, uh, people have been moving to in mass over the last three, four years, like no other state in the country. Arkansas. Tennessee, also a red-hot state, no pun intended, at number eight. Indiana comes in at seven, Alabama four, tied with South Carolina, 
three Louisiana, two Oklahoma, and one Texas. Now, I went back and I looked up the 10 states that people have moved to the most over the last couple of years. And what's interesting is that number one was Texas, per CBS News. Number two was Florida. Number three was South Carolina. And number six was Tennessee. Four of the top six states that people are moving to in this country, when it comes to incoming residents versus outgoing residents, four of the top six in this country are also states that, according to CNBC, are the worst states to live and work in in America. What does that tell you? Does that suggest to you that maybe when it comes to being, oh, out of touch with what the actual American worker and the American citizen wants, what they yearn for, what they search for, what they seek in their lives— what they want to be a part of when it comes to culture and family? Is it possible that CNBC, stuck in its bubble in midtown Manhattan, might not have the pulse of what people want, what people search for, what they need, what they require when they move, when they want to start a family, when they want to start that new business? What do all of these states have in common? Yes, they're red states. And I see many on the left trying to dunk on red states by using this this list. And you know what? All it does is they're dunking on themselves because they don't realize what people actually value, what people want, why people are fleeing to Texas and Florida and Tennessee and South Carolina. And it's not just because of the weather. It's an easy thing to point out, ah, people just, you know, it's all about the weather. That's all that, no, it's not just about the weather. It never has been only about the weather. The weather might be part of it, but it's about a lot more than that. And as long as they keep putting out these ridiculous lists on CNBC, then guess what? They're going to continue to wonder, hmm, why aren't people voting and doing essentially what we tell them to do? Maybe you got to look in the mirror. Just a suggestion. News is coming up in a couple of minutes here on KCMO Talk Radio, 913-408-7710. On that note, Trump says he could pick a primary opponent as his running mate. Who might that be? We'll get to it next. I know. I know it's early. I don't mean early in the morning on a Monday. It's good to be here on KCMO Talk Radio. I mean it's early in the 2024 conversation. I understand that. I'm well aware of that. However, it was a big weekend. For those of you that like to follow presidential politics, you had a big event take place up in Iowa in the last couple of days where many of the top contenders, not Trump, but many of the top contenders sat down for an interview, uh, a one-on-one type setting with Tucker Carlson. He took care of that up in Iowa. And then you had a big event down in Florida, which was put on by the Turning Point USA folks. So despite the fact that we are still well over a month away from the first GOP debate that will take place at the end of August in Milwaukee, uh, and the fact that we are still, you know, five months away from the Iowa caucuses, it just was randomly a big weekend for those of us who are following this stuff and keeping tabs on all this. So it's not that we're trying to jump ahead. We're not trying to create a storyline where there isn't one. There were all of these folks on full display this weekend in different cases and different scenarios in different places, either Iowa or Florida or in some cases both. And Donald Trump obviously is the front runner right now for the Republican nomination, and it is not all that close. DeSantis has not gotten the traction that many of us thought he would get. Um, Nobody else is really all that close. It is Trump's to lose as we sit here on July 17th. So naturally, you know, people are kind of wondering, okay, if this is Donald Trump's nomination, who is he picking? We certainly know it's not his old pal, Mike Pence, who he calls a traitor. So traitor Mike is (laughs) is not going to get the nod. The question is then who? Well, here's what Trump had to say. He was on with Maria Bartiromo over the weekend on Fox News Business. Here is what he said about who he could potentially pick as his running mate. Let's take a listen. Is there anyone on that stage you see as potential running mate, as your VP? Possibly, yeah. I mean, I think you have some good people on the stage, actually. I think you have some very talented people. 
I've been impressed by some of them. Some of them I'm very friendly with, actually. Uh, a number of them called me up, not to ask for permission, but sort of to ask for permission, to say they'd like to do it. A number of the people up there, uh, I'm not going to embarrass them by saying who, but no, I, I think you have good people. I think you have good potential cabinet members, too. Actually, uh, who would that? Well, who, I don't want to mention that. I think I can't. Do but. you see yourself perhaps with a senator, Tim Scott? I think he's a very good guy. We did opportunity zones together. It's uh, never been talked about. It's one of the most successful economic development things ever done in this country. And Tim is very good. So that was Trump on Maria Bartiromo's show talking about who he would potentially select to be his VP. And he clearly there mentioned Tim Scott. He talked about Vivek Ramaswamy, the multimillionaire uh, tech guru who is under the age of 40, who has been very uh, pro-Trump during his presidential campaign here over the last few months. So clearly those people are out there. Clearly those people are ones who might make sense for Donald Trump. But if I'm Trump, I'm looking far closer at somebody like a Tim Scott than a Vivek Ramaswamy. Right, Vivek Ramaswamy is kind of a poor man's minority version of Donald Trump. And I don't mean literally because he's poorer than Donald Trump. I mean, like, he doesn't bring anything new to the equation. If you are somebody who is rah rah Trump because outsider, businessman, different perspective on government, then why do you need Vivek Ramaswamy? The idea of a VP pick is to pick somebody theoretically in a perfect world that doesn't always work out like this, but somebody who balances you out from the standpoint of gets you votes that you might not otherwise get in a perfect world. Now, I think with Trump, he's in his own galaxy because everybody has an opinion on Trump. He's already been the president. I don't think there's a VP pick that Trump can really select who will win over certain voters who are on the fence. I just don't think because of the strong feelings around Trump that that person really exists because of how unique a candidate he is. But it still makes sense to pick somebody based off of that. So who might that person be? Well, it's far more likely to be a Tim Scott than it is, say, a Vivek Ramaswamy or really anybody else that, that I can think of that comes to mind. I mean, Mike Pence. Why was Mike Pence picked by Donald Trump? The thought was, well, you know, evangelicals may be kind of wishy-washy on this guy who's uh, you know, from midtown Manhattan. He doesn't really know anything about Christianity, broadly speaking. He's been married a bunch of times, divorced a bunch of times, you know, multiple uh, children with multiple women. I mean, that may turn off the evangelical voter. So enter Mike Pence. Mike Pence knows D.C., spent time as a congressman. He was a governor. He's an evangelical. Like, that balanced out what the perception was about Donald Trump in some Republican ranks. So that made sense. Go back to... John McCain selecting Sarah Palin. That was supposedly to try to shore up the base of the Republican Party. Now, not a great selection in hindsight, but also McCain wasn't necessarily a great candidate or the perfect candidate for that time. So you always try to pick Barack Obama picking grandpa, who wasn't a grandpa when he picked him. But the idea was Obama was the new guy, the hope and change guy, didn't really know D.C., first-term U.S. senator. Let's bring in the guy who knows Washington, D.C., like Joe Biden does, who's been there for, at the time, 40, you know, 30, 40 years. Let's bring in that guy who's perceived to be, at the time, moderate, works across the aisle, has Republican friends, has Democratic friends. That was the perception of Joe Biden. It did something to help Barack Obama's candidacy. And obviously it worked, despite the fact that, you know, Obama knew Joe was an idiot. I mean, he's, he said as much privately and sometimes it leaked out publicly. Joe Biden was there to achieve something for Barack Obama. He did something to help Barack Obama's candidacy. So who is that? I mean, does that person even exist for Donald Trump? At 913-408-7710. Or is he just such a unique candidate because he's already been president and because he draws up such strong emotions that it really doesn't matter. But if you're somebody who's maybe on the fence about Trump, maybe isn't quite sure on whether or not you want him to be the nominee, is there somebody that he could select 
that would make you say to yourself, you know what, I, 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 I'm really not all in on Trump right now, but if he were to pick fill in the blank, I can get on board with that. Like, I saw at the Turning Point USA event in Florida over the weekend, they did a straw poll on who they want to see Trump's VP pick be. And the winner of that straw poll was Carrie Lake, the former Arizona GOP nominee who, of course, lost. I can't think of a worse pick for Donald Trump than Carrie Lake. And I know that Carrie was on the show on Friday, whatever. That's not the point. In terms of picking a, a vice president in terms of picking somebody who appeals to voters who might not otherwise vote for Donald Trump, that's how you have to think of your VP pick. Carrie Lake does not bring anybody new to the equation. And by the way, she, she is a loser. She just lost a race for governor in Arizona, in a state that Trump desperately needs to try to get back into his column if he's going to win in 2024. So who is that? Who is that person? Does that person exist for Donald Trump? On the text line, Pete, Trump needs a high-quality female. The South Dakota governor fits well. That would be Christy Nome. Maybe it is Christy Nome, uh, but here's the thing. Does South Dakota bring, you know, you have to think about the state too. Does that state bring anything to the equation? She'd be a strong pick. She's done a nice job. But I think some of the shine has worn off of Christy Nome a little bit. She seems like somebody who has got some juice and had some gravitas a year ago, but it seems like she has kind of lost that luster. She was somebody who a lot of people thought was going to end up being selected, or I should say declaring that she's going to run for president. Obviously, that's not going to happen. I don't think that Christy Nome does anything for Donald Trump. Yeah. I think a Tim Scott might do it, John, mm-hmm. but I don't see Christy Nome doing it. I get into this sports mindset I have to break out of. When you're drafting as a team, sometimes you get in trouble when you are drafting for a need versus the best athlete available. The case of, say, Kerry Lake might be the best athlete available, but you're drafting for a need in this situation to counterbalance, right? That's a, yes, that's analogy? a very good point. Mm-hmm. Yes, I love that sports analogy. Mm-hmm. You're not picking, it's like, yeah, NFL draft. Mm-hmm. You either, some, some teams like to pick the best available, others like to pick based on need. The Chiefs pick based on need. I like how the Chiefs do business. They typically pick based on need. And if I'm Trump, I wouldn't pick the best available. Whatever you think the most uh, pro-Trump VP pick out, is out there, that doesn't make a lot of sense. On the text line, Pete, it would have to be Nikki Haley or Tim Scott. It's interesting because neither Nikki Haley or Tim Scott have been going after Trump pretty hard, which makes me wonder if either of them or both of them would accept that if Trump called them up and said, hey, you want to be my pick? You want to be my VP selection? And I think that Nikki Haley picking a woman is not the worst idea in the world for Donald Trump. That could help him in a small way. And remember, all you got to do is move a couple thousand votes. I mean, here's what this election is going to come down to. It's going to come down to Georgia, Arizona, uh, probably not Florida, but let's say Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin. That's probably it. And you're talking about a few thousand votes either way in, in each of those states. That's all you're talking about here. So those two make as much sense as any. 913-408-7710. Now that Trump is already talking because he is in the big lead, he's talking like somebody who has this nomination locked up. He spoke glowingly of Tim Scott. Could that be his pick? Is there somebody else you'd want to see? 913-408-7710. And I'll tell you something else I heard about Kerry Lake and why I don't think she's going to be the pick, coming up on KCMO. Well, this is very interesting. There's a lot of Tim Scott fans on the text line here. This after Donald Trump talked over the weekend to Maria Bartiromo about who he might want to be his vice presidential pick, and he specifically was asked about uh, Tim Scott, and he raved about Tim Scott. He had nothing but nice things to say about Tim Scott. Here's some of the feedback that we've got here on the text line uh, from you. Pete, Tim Scott would make a big difference with more minority votes. Many black and Latino voters already starting to lean Republican, and Scott would tip many to the Republican side of the aisle. Okay, that's on the text line. 
Uh, what else do we have here? Pete, uh, big Tim Scott fan. I think he could do wonders for Donald Trump. Pete, Tim Scott would make the most sense. Uh, not a lot of Kerry Lake. Well, Kerry Lake is getting mixed reviews on the text line. Some of you love Kerry Lake. Some of you are saying Kerry Lake is a loser and a whiner. Uh, <laughs> Pete, we don't need two candidates griping about losing their last elections. You know, I, I would lean that way as well. But here's what I've heard about Kerry Lake. What I've heard about Kerry Lake is that Trump is starting to sour on Kerry Lake because he views her as an opportunist who is simply trying to ride the Trump gravy train. And I do believe that as well. And I think Trump is wise and smart to notice what that grift is all about with Carrie Lake. She is trying to ride Donald Trump to fame and potentially fortune. I mean, there's I understand everyone has to kiss the ring to some degree, but there's kiss in the ring and then there's kiss in the ring and also kiss in the rear end. And Carrie Lake is doing a little too much of both while also trying to self-promote as much as she can, new book, the whole thing. So if I'm Trump, I'm staying far away from Kerry Lake. And everything I've heard suggests that he is also wising up to that. And I got to give him credit for that. Because sometimes you might get caught up in the, wow, this person really loves me. This person really thinks you know, highly of me. This person's really a big fan of mine. And especially when you're Trump and those things matter to you, you might get caught up with that kind of a mindset. But in this case, you got to be careful. And Trump would be wise to look at somebody like a Tim Scott, who, once again, yes, he's much more moderate, let's say, than Donald Trump might be. But no one's going to question Trump's credentials because the guy's been president for four years and he's got a track record. And you know as well as I do, when push comes to shove, Tim Scott's not going to tell Donald Trump what to do or what policies to push and what policies to pass. He's not going to do that. So that's where it's a win-win for Trump. If he goes with somebody who's perceived to be more moderate, he's not going to lose his base over it, right? You tell me. I mean, if you're a, if you're a diehard Trump, are you going to turn on Trump because he picks Tim Scott over Kerry Lake? No, you're not. And why would you? That'd be insane. That'd be stupid. 913-408-7710. Uh, Paul is in Kansas City. Paul, good morning. Who do you want? Uh, Joe Benson, West Virginia. I'll tell you what. You Back want old days, Joe Manchin, a Democrat U.S. senator from West Virginia. Now, tell me why, because West Virginia as a state, I think, voted for Trump by a wider margin than any other state in the country. They did. In the old days, they used to split the ticket like that. But here's one thing that Joe brings. He brings bitterness. That What Biden's done to him in his state, Joe's up there in New Hampshire kind of wandering around a little bit, and he'll bring that bitterness to the ticket. And then <laughs> The old man can say, "Hey, look at me! I'm, I'm a I'm a I'm a uniter. I got a Democrat as my vice president. Nowhere since the hundred years have we done that." And, and Joe and, and Manchin, give him what you can. He's, he's very wily. He knows the Senate. Uh, yeah, it'd be an interesting pick. And uh, Joe's bitter. He is. He he brings that to the campaign trail. That could be interesting. Anyway, just a thought. But uh, I thought it'd be interesting. Thank you, Paul. That is interesting. Now, there's been some thought that Joe Manchin may consider. Uh, an independent run for president. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think it's likely. I I know that people, generally speaking, polls show don't like Trump or Biden, so there might be for the first time in, uh, you know, decades an actual lane for a third-party candidate. But it's not going to be Joe Manchin. He just doesn't have the pizzazz, the juice, or anything like that to make it happen. But that would be telling. Could you imagine the media meltdown if Trump picked a Democrat? like Joe Manchin. I mean, that in and of itself might be worth it. They would turn on a guy like Joe Manchin so fast. They would blast that guy into oblivion. You would, uh, it would be hard to find a Democrat in the history of mainstream media who will be as treated as poorly as Joe Manchin will if he were to join a Donald Trump ticket as a Democrat. That would be absolutely wild. But I like the, I mean, you think about the idea at its very core, Paul. Donald Trump basically saying to the American electorate, you may not like me, but let's be honest. The mainstream, the left of center Democrat has been completely left behind by its own party. Who now believes in bailing out student loan debt. 
who now believes in destroying the American dream through high taxes and more government oversight, who believes that boys can be girls and girls can be boys. You do not have a political home. Here I am, Donald Trump, and say what you want about me personally, but Trump for most of his life was a Democrat. He's really more of a populist than he is a true Republican. And here he is picking a guy as his VP pick, potentially in Joe Manchin, which is what Paul just proposed, who I, you know, would send these people into a complete tizzy. And that in and of itself would be worth the price of admission. I, I don't see it happening, Paul, but I am very, very intrigued by something completely outside the box like that. And nothing would surprise me this time around with Donald Trump in terms of what direction he might ultimately go with a pick like this. Since let's be honest, until the polls start showing otherwise, he is rolling to a renomination in 2024, like it or not. Coming up on KCMO Talk Radio, uh, a good piece on how downtown momentum may be stalling and the Royals going up north could be that final nail in the coffin. We'll get to it next. Pete Mundo on KCMO. Got to give credit where it's due to Tony's Kansas City. Obviously, Tony does an outstanding job with that website, that local blog, for lack of a better word, that covers Kansas City as well as anybody. And I'm reading Tony's Sunday edition of his website because, you know, there's nothing to read in the Kansas City Star. Half the articles aren't even local anymore. And it's certainly mostly propaganda. And here's the headline from Tony's Kansas City on the Royals. By the way, happy Monday morning. It is great to be back on KCMO Talk Radio. Hope those of you dealing with power outages are uh, getting back that power. Still about 14,000 of you without it, and we'll keep you posted throughout the morning here on KCMO. The headline here from Tony's Kansas City reads as follows. Royals move across river threatens downtown Kansas City momentum. And by the way, that is absolutely accurate with that analysis. Tony goes on the right here. Royals moving to nice side of the bridge would devastate investor confidence in downtown Kansas City. And he goes on the note why the Royals might move. Better highway and mass transit access, better public safety, lower crime stats for fans and families. More enthusiasm from state lawmakers and residents, all things that we've talked about on this show in terms of why the Royals up north make more sense with each passing day and why the momentum is moving in favor of North Kansas City over KC Mo every single day. But Tony goes on the note here in this article that he put up, Royals ditching downtown Kansas City would destroy confidence in the economic future inside the loop. Now, I don't know if it would destroy it, but it certainly wouldn't help its cause, right? I mean, Kansas City has spent the better part of 15 to 20 years trying to build up the loop. And by the way, they're not alone in this. Every major American city over the last 15, 20 years has done giveaway after giveaway after giveaway to build up a downtown, air quotes. Right? What that means to you, what that means to uh, each city is a little bit different. But for the most part, that has been a big push in cities around the country. The problem is, three years ago, the unthinkable happened. COVID happened. And then suddenly we wound up in a situation where people didn't want to live in a one bedroom or maybe a two bedroom apartment downtown. That's not what they wanted anymore. Suddenly what they wanted was more space. They didn't have to be in the office five days a week. So what did they want to do? They wanted to find an area or find a place that they could ultimately live and have some more room and have some more freedom and all those different things. That's what they wanted. That's what they started searching for. So the whole buildup of downtown got to the point where people said, geez, I I don't really need this anymore. I don't need to be a short walk away from the downtown office. There are other things that I can do that can make this, uh, you know, much more enjoyable for me. And people started looking at the suburbs. And then also what happened, millennials finally started to settle down. They started to have kids and they started to do things that other generations did earlier but still was very much part of what they were looking for in their lives. So this whole build-up high-rises downtown for millennials who want to live in a shoebox because they want to go out to 
dinner and get drinks after work. They're going to be in an office downtown, and this is going to be the lifestyle they want. It all blew up three years ago. So that has been one of the many reasons that we've seen this move away from downtown from a residential standpoint and then also a commercial standpoint. I mean, who is right now looking for office space? Who's looking to add office space to their footprint? Unless you're Amazon and you're building a new warehouse or you're some big tech company, most people are looking for less office space from a commercial real estate perspective, not more. There's a belief that the commercial real estate market could be one that collapses at some point in the next couple of years. So all this impacts downtown Kansas City, just like it impacts downtowns across the country. But now if you have the Royals who are looking at a $2 billion project and they potentially decide we're not going inside the downtown loop, that would be catastrophic. That would be a horrible, horrible indictment on the future of downtown Kansas City. And Quentin Lucas, I believe, knows it. I think the mayor of Kansas City deep down understands that I've got a crime issue, I've got a tax base issue, and now I potentially have a problem when it comes to one of our two major sports franchises deciding they don't want to be in this city anymore. And the Royals are not going to talk about the downside of Kansas City if they ultimately leave. They will talk about the pros of North KC, the future of Clay County. They'll spin it positively because that's what they're incentivized to do. But those of us paying attention and those of us willing to be a little more truthful about why they wouldn't want to reside in Kansas City, Missouri anymore, understand that as much as, yes, they're excited about North KC and they see a lot of potential for North KC and Clay County and all these other things, it's also very much an indictment on what Kansas City, Missouri has become politically from a business perspective and from a safety perspective. They won't do that. They, they won't tell that story. But I'll tell you what, I mean, there was a big article, and Tony linked to this in the New York Times over the weekend. The New York Times had this huge article over the weekend about how people are fleeing downtowns across the country. The headline, what comes next for the mostly empty downtown in America? The article says here, tech workers are still at home. The $17 salad place is expanding into the suburbs. So what is left of San Francisco? And it highlights San Francisco. But the general theme of the story in the New York Times is about how downtowns across the country have been hurting big time over the last three years, and there's no end in sight. There's no end in sight on reversing the losses for downtown, whether it's restaurants, whether it's commercial real estate, whether it's residential, it's all hurting. And if you're the Kansas City Royals and you're looking at the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years and you see the way of the world today, are you going to invest up to $2 billion with the way the world is today and the way Kansas City is today and the way it's trending right now in downtown inside the loop? Are you going to do that if you're John Sherman? I think you'd be insane to do that. So that's how this story comes to be, and that's how, yes, it would be. It's not just about the Royals going potentially north of the river. It's what it would mean for downtown Kansas City investment, which they obviously have been pumping for the better part of you know, 15 to 20 years at this point. 913-408-7710, and that's why it's something as well that is worth watching beyond. It's not a sports story. Don't kid yourself. This is not a sports story. This is not about the Royals and baseball. This is far more an economic development story, a political story, than it is, well, where's the baseball team going to play? How much money are they going to spend on the baseball team? That's not what this is ultimately about. This is about the future of a city that over the last three years has made political miscalculation after political miscalculation, and just a couple of weeks ago, elected its most progressive city council in Kansas City, Missouri history. If you're John Sherman, are you investing up to $2 billion in that? 913-408-7710. It is 713 on a Monday morning. It's great to be here. Pete Mundo on KCMO Talk Radio, 710 AM and 103.7 FM. Now, speaking of the leader of Kansas City, Quentin Lucas, 
I saw him out on social media trying to help people with some of their storm cleanup over the weekend. That was uh, very nice of him. But what about his political future? Where is it? Where might it be? Where might it take place? Well, many people have thought he's an obvious replacement for Emmanuel Cleaver. I have long said, don't count on that. And there's a lot of reasons for it. Now somebody else is saying it. We'll dive into that coming up on KCMO Talk Radio, 710 AM, 103.7 FM, and also on the all-new KCMO Talk Radio app. Welcome in. Happy Monday. Hope your week is off to a great start. Thanks for joining us here on KCMO Talk Radio. So we were just diving into the Royals and how another report suggests, this from Tony's Kansas City, that uh, if they do go north of the river, it is going to be a huge blow to development inside the downtown loop. And that is absolutely true. It will be another sign that the future is not in downtown. And that's not just in Kansas City. That's around the country. Because you go back 15, 20 years, all the new baseball stadiums, the ballparks were quote-unquote downtown, air quotes downtown. Now, the great stadiums, Fenway Park, even like a Wrigley Field. I mean, they became what they were. They're not in a true downtown setting. But, yes, they're inside city limits. And they have their own experiences around the stadium. But it really, those stadiums, if you've been to them, are not truly downtown, what you would perceive to be downtown. But you look at many of the new ballparks that popped up the last 15, 20 years. And they went for the downtown because cities wanted to build up their downtown experience. Well, that has all changed the last three years. COVID changed it, right? Millennials settling down, having families finally changed it. Crime has changed it. And that's why the trend and the momentum is with the Royals going north KC, going up to Clay County. Now, that would be a political blow for Kansas City, Missouri. There's no doubt about it. And I think that Quentin Lucas is slowly starting to realize that this possibility is legitimate. I mean, three months ago, he scoffed at it. He scoffed at the idea that the Royals would be anywhere but Kansas City, Missouri. He has tempered those comments quite a bit in recent weeks because he knows, like we all do, and like I've shared with you on this show, that there is a possibility, in fact, a growing possibility, that the Royals go up north. Now, speaking of Quentin Lucas, his political future. There have been reports in recent weeks that he is very much exploring a run for U.S. Senate against Josh Hawley. I think that's career suicide. I just I I cannot understand why any Democrat in this climate going into 2024 in Missouri would believe they could beat Josh Hawley. But one of the reasons that Quentin Lucas may ultimately consider it, well, there's long been this opinion that Quentin Lucas is a shoe in to replace Emmanuel Cleaver whenever that time does come, that Emmanuel Cleaver decides that he is going to move on and do something, or just not do something else, hopefully. (laughs) But, uh, you know, Emmanuel Cleaver being 78 years old is just going to ultimately retire from Missouri's 5th Congressional District, which is a strong Democratic district. It's one of only two in the state where you feel good about getting a Democrat elected. And it's often been believed that, hey, that's, you know, Quentin Lucas, he's just going to go replace Cleaver whenever that time comes, and that's going to be that. Well, I've said on this show that Emmanuel Cleaver and Quentin Lucas are not exactly buddy-buddy from what I've heard. Emmanuel Cleaver is not looking to hand the baton off to Quentin Lucas. I don't know how much or if any bad blood may exist. But the notion that they are buddy-buddy is certainly not the case from everything I've been told. And if you don't think that petty inside baseball politics play a role in who Emmanuel Cleaver would want to ultimately replace him, then you are kidding yourself. There is no doubt in my mind that when it comes to somebody like Emmanuel Cleaver, who has held his seat for years, and by the way, Cleaver could hold this seat for another 10 years, be 88, and not be the oldest guy in Congress. Think about that. Once again, can we get some damn term limits here? Not term limits, but age limits, along with term limits, please. If you don't think that the egos of people like Emmanuel Cleaver would play a role in selecting a successor, then uh, you don't know these politicians who have enormous egos 
and want to play a role in oftentimes play a role in picking their successors. Heck, Sly James wanted to do it. He picked Jolie Justice. She ends up losing to Quentin Lucas. So Tony's Kansas City has this report here. It says Congressman Cleaver will stay in office until he's 125 years old rather than give his blessing to Mayor Q. And I thought to myself, okay, now that is much more, that's a much stronger statement than what I've heard and what I've been told. But the point is taken. The point is Emmanuel Cleaver is not going to step aside to make it convenient for Quentin Lucas to further his political career. Tony goes on to report the current 12th and Oak boss, meaning Quentin Lucas, will not get the congressman's blessing anytime soon despite an epic war chest and rising star importance inside the Beltway. Tony reports local insiders offer many reasons for this fact of life, saying, one, the mayor's too radical for Emmanuel Cleaver's liking. Number two, the congressman is in decent shape and could have another two to three terms, and he still would not be the oldest guy in the House. And number three, every skilled politico knows that picking your replacement is a dangerous game and increasingly unlikely, given the current climate. The softest landing spot for Mayor Q is unavailable, as Tony's Kansas City continues to contend. He will not serve out the remainder of his term as mayor and wisely looks to avoid playing the bad guy in Kansas City until the bitter end. So uh, you look at Emmanuel Cleaver. And I see a guy who's not slowing down. Here's also what I have been told by somebody who is very good friends with Emmanuel Cleaver. Emmanuel Cleaver is one of these guys where when he retires, he would not know what to do with himself. Now, some people are like, you know, no, I'll just, I'll just go whenever. But no, he would not know what to do with himself. And guys like that, when you got a cushy job like being a congressman in a district you don't really have to run for re-election in because you're going to win every time as a Democrat – it's a pretty good gig, as long as you can get on a plane a bunch of times every year. That's the biggest pain. <laughs> Outside of that, it's pretty cushy. Coming up, a wild experience at the airport I've never had before, then the good, the bad, and the ugly.